of applause for the drummers. Great job. Good afternoon uh, and welcome to the second in the series of this trilogy, Blacks in America, 400 years plus. I'm your host, um, Jack Kirkland, and um, I'm the chair of this series. The first of the series uh, actually started uh, some Oh, months ago, uh, in February, and the series actually is a a trick of time, and it goes from the uh, very very early years, uh, and that's why it's called 400 years plus, because blacks were here um, many many years before the time that is indicated on your programs, and as uh, we came, we came as very industrious, we came as very um, uh, adventurous, and we came uh, as a people free and, and explorative. And so what happened 
over the years, uh, you, 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 you read in your history, which gives you the, the, the thought or the, the indication that blacks came as slaves, which obviously is far from the truth. Um, blacks came and explored North America many, many years ago. And so the presentations are going to flow and they're going to be um, sketched out. Um, and you're going to look at the presenters and information about their um, personage is on the program. And since the, the civil rights movement, which is the emphasis of this particular uh, part of the trilogy, is the focus of today, I want to um, put it in the context of how it got its impetus. And the impetus of the civil rights movement, as you know, and the real arm and support of it uh, came out of the um, African-American church. And obviously, we associate that movement with Dr. Martin Luther King. And so as the movement uh, came out of the church, it was natural and quite um, proper that we would start our programs with um, the prayer that our churches provided for the emphasis of, of this movement. And so we're going to have um, this afternoon, we're going to have prayers by uh, two individuals, and one is the Baptist uh, pastor of St. Paul, and that is the church uh, that I attend. And the name of the pastor is Gary Gaston, and he can um, come forward. And following will be a prayer um, by Rabbi Jeffrey Stiffman, and he's with the congregation of Shira Emma, and he's going to give a prayer. And it's the natural thing to happen because the civil rights movement was embraced and joined by the Jewish population. And so the first of our series was with a Baptist prayer only. And so the joining of this movement uh, with the Jewish uh, uh, congregation and the Jewish uh, affiliation, we most naturally will have a rabbi. And I am very privileged to say that I know both of them. And I think that this is a very excellent way for us to begin. So we'll start with the prayer from the Baptist Church, and that will be um, uh, Reverend Gaston. Please bow your head. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you that in 1619, blacks came to America. And through our journey, Lord, you have sustained us and kept us and enriched our lives. Lord, we thank you for the struggle, for it has strengthened us, Lord, and emboldened us. And we just pray, Lord, that you continue to strengthen our people and this nation, Lord, that we might obtain the victory, Lord, that we deserve. Lord, we thank you for all of those who are gone on before. We thank you for those who are present, who are fighting for equal rights still. For, Lord, we know and we realize that we will come out victorious if we keep pushing and believing, for we are a strong people, and we thank you that you have sustained us and that you are keeping us. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And now we'll have a prayer from the rabbi. Thank you, Professor Kirkland, one of my mentors. Thank you very much. 
Shalom, salam, peace. We gather to remember a 400-year history, and we experience so many emotions today. Our souls are agitated by so much of that history, and yet we are also comforted as we celebrate the civil rights heroes and heroines who spoke with dignity, fought with vigor, and challenged us with the words, we shall overcome. On June 19th, we will celebrate 151 years since the very last slaves were liberated by the Union forces in Galveston. Once again, we will feel the horrors of slavery and the hope of emancipation, knowing that we still have a long road to full equality. I come from a tradition that celebrates a freedom, my people's exodus from Egypt, during our Passover Seder, our Passover meal, each of us is required to relive and feel the bitterness of slavery and the exaltation of freedom. Every single day in the Jewish prayer book, we are told to do justly and thank God for our freedom. In Hebrew, it says, Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim, in remembrance of the exodus from Egypt. As we celebrate today and in 17 days on June 19th, may we all say that we are grateful for freedom, but that we are not through, that we must work so that all will be free. And so we pray, dear creator of all, we thank you for this moment of remembrance and challenge. We thank you for the time once again to meditate on the trials and triumphs of those who have gone before us. We pray that we may use these moments, each of us, to renew pride in our identity, to affirm that each of us are created in your image. Help us, we pray, to strengthen our efforts to eradicate hatred and bigotry, shaming and bullying, grinding poverty and numbing of the spirit. Help us to proudly stand for the values in our faiths, the inherent dignity in every human being, and the hope that we can bring about a better world so that the next 400 years will be even better than the last and the latter days will be better than the former. This we ask in the name of all your children, amen. Thank you very much, uh, pastor and rabbi. You know, um, the movement um, was sustained by the arts, by music, um, and without music, uh, the traditional we shall overcome uh, and other kinds of lyrics um, we would have lost uh, I think our rhythm I think we would have lost uh, our courage um, and it's very obvious that we were able to stand up and and literally um, help ourselves to uh, to sing through some very miserable moments in our lives. And so I would like to ask our choir uh, if they would come forward and, and give us some music and some, and some uh, strength.
Yeah. Those may have sounded like hymns, but those are war songs. Uh, <laughs> and that's the kind of rhythm that allowed us to maintain our momentum uh, as we stood in battle and as we recognized that battle was going to be essentially the theme and the song for the rest of our lives unless we organized in some way that challenged and confronted the system. And the Civil Rights Movement indeed accomplished that. And surely we have a long way to go. There's a piece that I wrote, uh, which is the centerpiece of your flyer, and you can read that at your discretion. And you can also um, pass it on to a friend or a relative, and they in turn can have the benefit of being here without being present. I came to this university some time ago uh, when battle was uh, front and foremost of this university, and it was the battle of getting blacks admitted and any kind of numbers that would look somewhat, uh, somewhat relevant to the population. And so I came on the shoulders of many uh, individuals who were protesting and, and many individuals who obviously were in battle. And it, it looked like they had at least one part of the siege because they had closed down the university. And subsequently, the university was willing to negotiate. And the negotiation was to permit black studies to be a program on this campus. Mind you, not a department, but a program. And so, out of those years, I not only served as a co-founder of Black Studies, but I also um, I served as a individual who was always challenging the system and the structure and wondering why the numbers did not reflect what in reality were the percentages of the black population in the area. And let me tell you, that has been a fight for a long time. But we're getting somewhat, somewhat close to the way it should be. And when you're in battle uh, and you've been under siege and you actually uh, are aware that the battle requires all that you can throw at it, you know, you begin to, to wonder, is there any way that you can relax? Is there any way that ultimately this situation will somehow rectify itself? And so after many years, you do know that in one more year, we will have a half century of black studies or African American studies on this campus. And, <laughs> and you, you begin to wonder, uh, is there some way that this can be sustained? Um, can you put this in the hands of somebody that is going to carry it forth and be a warrior as well. And I have the privilege of introducing the next person who I am sure is that warrior. Um, as she walks up, her name is Adrian Davis.
She has all those titles that you see on the page and more. That's, strip, that's just a little sketch of who she is. But she recently received another title, which is the Founding Director, University-Wide Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity, and Equality. And believe me, Adrian does more than study. Uh, she puts it in play. She puts it in action, and she causes people to move according to what they claim they are about. And so I'll just let you hear her tell you how effectively she's doing this thing. Adrian. Um, Jack's introductions always make me very, <laughs> very nervous. Uh, first and foremost, welcome to Washington University today. And once again, I want to start by thanking my senior colleague, a hero to many of us faculty members and many of us who are here today, the extraordinary Jack Kirkland. I want to reiterate what I said about Jack at the first part in this trilogy in February. Some people believe that becoming an academic means leaving behind childish things, things like caring for others, activism, and a deep and abiding belief that we all have a responsibility to repair the deep injustices of this world. Jack shows us the profound untruth of this myth. Jack co-founded Black Studies at Washington University, which is just celebrating, as you said, its 50th year on our campus. And I want to thank you for that extraordinary vision and your tenaciousness in helping to found not only a program, but a very field that has transformed how the world understands black people, our culture, our history, as well as racism, racial identity, and racial justice. Without black studies, we would not have critical race theory. We would not have black feminist thought. And Asian American studies and Latinx studies would be on a much more difficult trail than they already are. Without black studies, we would not have much of the fundamental, fundamental vocabulary and grammar of race and justice that we collectively speak today. Jack, on behalf of all of us, thank you for your work. And we also want to thank you for the second in this crucial trilogy, Civil Rights, Past and Present. Today's event, taking place this first Sunday in June, honors Juneteenth and commemorates the abolition of slavery in the former Confederate States. 1619, almost two centuries before American became a nation, slavery had defined us. It set us on a collision course toward two principles that could not be squared. The Founding Fathers' promise of democracy and liberty for all, and the antithesis that they baked into the Constitution of the rights of some humans to lay claim to own others, to own their bodies, and to seek, day in and day out, power over their minds, hearts, and souls, to, claim, to lay claim to not only their labor, but also their children and their families. Our region here in St. Louis and Missouri has been in the midst of this battle for bodies, hearts, minds, and souls of not only black people's right and need to be fully free, but for our nation to fully break free for its own heart, mind, and soul. 200 years after the Missouri Compromise and 160 years after the Supreme Court's Dred Scott decision, the St. Louis region continues to be at the fulcrum of the nation's debates over race, racism, and racial equality. In just the short time that I have lived here, 
I have witnessed the uprisings in Ferguson, the Mizzou student protests, an NAACP boycott of our state, and the Stockley verdict, to name only a few of the racial earthquakes that rumbled across the nation from our heartland. We have seen some small movement forward, but not nearly enough. Most recently, our African-American Supreme Court Justice wants us to believe that giving black women, our partners, and our families the ability to make our own decisions about our families is tantamount to genocide. We know that that is not genocide. We also know that the laws continue down the path that Missouri and Mississippi have set forth. We will see even more black women and black doctors become incarcerated, labeled as felons, and disenfranchised. Call that part 12 of mass incarceration. At Washington University in St. Louis, we too sit in the shadow of slavery, Jim Crow, and the crisis of the American core and racial injustice. Yet as I've said before, quoting my chancellor, great universities solve the problems of the world. And racial and ethnic injustice is one of the great problems of our world. Across Forest Park, my colleagues at the medical center literally cure cancer. Given the long arc of slavery, our efforts towards racial justice are still young. But I'd like to share with you some of what we have accomplished as a testament to what we can do when we try to walk our values. And Jack encouraged me to share some of this with us. Um, and I like to share it because, Jack, you set us on this path. We have long struggled to attract African-American faculty members to Washington University. But over the course of the last eight years, we have been able to increase our African-American faculty 113%, and we are now 7% of the Danforth campus. We have a long way to go, but if I, tell, I tell people if we have another five years, like the last five years, we would be the national leaders. In terms of our senior black administrators, we've increased these numbers from three to 20. Our undergraduate student numbers, and this is where the future is, of course. Our undergraduate student numbers are currently 12% of our incoming undergraduate students are African Americans, 15% at the law school. And we wake up every morning to try to figure out how to give them the education that they deserve and that they have earned. As we said, African and African American Studies is celebrating its 50th anniversary under the leadership of Professor Gerald Early, became a department with the ability to hire its own faculty and to pursue its own scholarly and teaching agenda. Washington University is proud to house the Black Rep and the African Film Festival. Our medical campus continues to expand its research on racial disparities and community engagement. The former chancellor of Webster University, Dr. Ben Akande, has joined our team. He now leads Washington University's Africa Initiative, taking our academic footprint to that crucial continent. Driving our work on changing the culture and climate of the university, which is so needed, is Nicole Hudson, Assistant Vice Chancellor and formerly a member of the Ferguson Commission and formerly Deputy Mayor for Racial Equity. But most of all, we are a research university. And as I said, great universities solve great problems, and racial injustice is one of the greatest problems in the world. We now have at Washington University a formidable faculty of all colors who work on race and ethnicity, including tackling ever-shifting forms of discrimination and political exclusion. I think of the children in cages at the border. Segregation in the built environment. How race is represented in popular culture and the media. And research on disparities in health 
education, and economic opportunity. This spring, our Chancellor-elect, Andrew Martin, announced that Washington University would create a new university-wide, bi-campus center for the study of race, ethnicity, and equity. Our center brings the research force of our university to study how race and ethnicity are integral to the most complex and challenging issues of our time. We believe in field-defining research, innovative learning, and strategic engagement that will transform scholarship, policy, and clinical interventions. And I said the name of our center is the Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity, and Equity. That's C-R-E-E, -E, or CRE, which means believe in Spanish. We invite people to believe with us in research as we galvanize and incubate new research architectures and vocabularies, insurgent methodologies and practices, and novel interventions in order to shape knowledge, understanding of the human experience, public discourse, and most of all, action. We invite you to believe with us in learning as we design next generation learning opportunities and environments that bring undergraduates, graduate, and professional students, postdocs and trainees, faculty, and we hope community members together to develop new capacities for understanding both the deep history and the global future of race and ethnicity. And we invite you to believe with us in community as we cultivate a cross-campus hub where faculty and students, along with local, national, and global citizens and leaders, can connect, collaborate, and believe together. Cree will forge and strengthen partnerships and encourage transformative initiatives to extend beyond the university. Now, we anticipate from Cree many research-focused initiatives because structural racism is built on a mighty foundation of knowledge and power, and it will take my colleagues and students' best work to dismantle it and replace it with something just. At the same time, we hope to be designing national and local policy disruptions and interventions, as well as inviting the community of St. Louis and the region to work with us to help tackle these great problems. Please look for our black arts initiatives, and also please look for the opportunity to submit requests to craft what people usually call white papers, but what we're going to call black papers. I would be remiss if I did not say that you are in for a special treat today, getting to hear Dr. Cornell Brooks, with whom I spent three glorious years in law school. Um, I'm just glad I'm getting to speak first, Cornell, because that's what I learned during those years of law school. It's always you want to speak before, Cornell. But thank you for being here and for bringing your passion and your insight and your, your, your wisdom to us. The last thing that I want to say is the ongoing effects of structural racism are powerful. But history has shown us that the heart of equality, the mind of justice, and the soul of liberation are mightier. Thank you. I think uh, I will leave this institution in good hands. Uh, <laughs> you know, some of you, like me, uh, as, a, as a youth, when you had the opportunity to have, oh, I guess maybe a hand down history book, uh, and you fumbled through your hand down history book, and you were looking for yourselves looking to see where black people uh, were in those history books, and you didn't see blackness. 
The irony of, of all of that is that, you know, you could uh, um, turn to the very first page and on it would be something that would say, um, civilization began in Africa. And, you know, you kind of feel kind of proud about that. You lick your finger and turn the page and it's 3,000 years and you're in Greece. And uh, you wonder what happened. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, what, what, what is very clear that if education is supposed to be a place where you learn self-esteem and adequacy and you've been chronicled out of existence for all practical purposes, then you begin to find uh, a way of trying to identify with somebody else. And that can cause a great deal of, well, I guess uh, tangled up nerves and, and uh, real mental problems. Because to be yourselves uh, is what the evidence should be presenting, and that should be presenting it in libraries and histories and what have you. We have with us um, today uh, some people who are in libraries uh, and people who are going to be talking with us about how you actually can be and find yourself chronicled uh, in the uh, various um, places that they will tell you about uh, when they come and, and speak with you. So uh, I'm going to um, uh, call upon Nadia, uh, she can walk, uh, okay. And as you're coming up, Nadia, uh, uh, you were very instrumental in the uh, committee and helping us to uh, look at the possibilities of, of how we could begin to move more and more information uh, into libraries. And so you want to come and share that with us? Thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. I'd like to thank Professor Jack Kirkland and our Vice Provost and University Librarian, Denise Stevens, Dean Mary McKay, um, the members of the steering committee, and of course our sponsors. Um, in particular, Mary Curtis Horowitz, who is with us today, and uh, she's truly made uh, today possible. Today is actually, yes, thank you. <laughs> Today's keynote presentation is um, the first in the Mary Curtis Horowitz Lecture Series on Civic Engagement and Social Policy. Her vision for this series is to address topics related to civil rights and social movements, and in doing so, highlight the university library's efforts to acquire, preserve, and make accessible collections that tell these stories of struggle, resistance, and perseverance. Um, one example, which we've, we've talked about already today, is the celebration of 50 years of black studies at Washington University. The Libraries is hosting an exhibition called Highlights of 50 Years of Black Study and Activism, featuring items from our university archives. This exhibit explores student activism, the history of black students on campus, the work of black faculty and staff, and university policies and collaborations that have shaped the black studies program over the last 50 years into the African and African American Studies Department. As always, the, this exhibition is free and open to the public and will be on display in Olin Library through September 22nd, and I hope you all take the opportunity to see it. In addition to collections that tell Washington University's unique story, the libraries house one of the nation's most significant moving image collections related to the civil rights movement the Henry Hampton Collection. Henry Hampton was a St. Louis native and a Washington University alum. He established the largest independent African-American owned production company of its time, Blackside Inc. Blackside was best known for its multi-episodic historical documentaries which aired on PBS and often focused on the stories of the marginalized and disenfranchised. Hampton originally aspired to be a fiction writer, but the circumstances of his life and upbringing in the segregated city of St. Louis during the 50s and the 60s led him to his great subject, 
the civil rights movement. Hampton's involvement in the 1965 protests in Selma, Alabama, inspired an idea for a film, but it would take 20 years to bring that story to the 20 million viewers who saw Eyes on the Prize. Eyes on the Prize aired in two parts on PBS in 1987 and 1990. It chronicled the struggle of the leaders of the movement as well as unknown heroes, including Ralph Abernathy, Joanne Robinson, Charles Sherrod, Rosa Parks, the late Unita Blackwell, and many, many more. The Boston Globe praised the series as one of the most distinguished documentary series in the history of broadcasting. In response to witnessing the unrest in Ferguson, Missouri, following the police killing of Michael Brown, professor and writer Jelani Cobb said, it was like I was watching Eyes on the Prize. Decades after its release, the relevance of Eyes on the Prize is undeniable. Hampton once said, we did not choose particularly popular subjects, but we did it because without understanding the nature of our history, we are weakened in our approach in dealing with any current reality. In 2001, Washington University Libraries became the permanent home and steward of the Henry Hampton Collection, which is comprised of all the materials gathered and created by Blackside. We work to support the understanding of the nature of history through the preservation and dissemination of this collection and others like it. However, making this important material accessible is not without its challenges. Part one of Eyes on the Prize, which is six hours long, was shot and edited on film. The film of this period is considered highly unstable. It's susceptible to a chemical decay known as vinegar syndrome that will ultimately destroy the film beyond repair, making it completely lost to history. Furthermore, the editing technique used to make Eyes on the Prize literally cut complete interviews into segments, leaving the portions known as outtakes inaccessible. For a series for which over 100 interviews were conducted, you can imagine that much of these interviews did not make it into the final program and that there is a great amount of historical value in these outtakes. However, in order to give access to the content of all six episodes and all interview outtakes, we would need to preserve them. In the context of film, preservation means creating a new copy on a more modern, stable film stock. In 2011, with the generous award of $550,000 from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, we embarked on the Eyes on the Prize Preservation Project. In four years, we completed the preservation of part one in all interview outtakes. It resulted in approximately 350,000 feet of film. That's enough to loop over the gateway arch more than 550 times. With the material preserved, we shifted our focus to its accessibility. We, we pursued funding from the National Historical Publications and Records Commission and were awarded $150,000 for the Eyes on the Prize interview digitization and reassembly project. We would digitize and reassemble 75 hours of interviews. Through digital reassembly, we would recreate the complete interviews and make them freely available for the first time in history. We would like, I would like to share with you a few min, a few, just a few minutes of this history, and I encourage you all to explore these interviews online as they can help us in understanding and changing our current reality. Thank you. In keeping with our... When I woke up the next... Uh, morning, I thought it was a head, it was a dream. So I jumped straight up, I went to the porch, and my grandfather was sitting on the porch, you know. So I asked him, I said, uh, Papa, I said, did they bring Bo back? He said, no. He said, I hope they didn't kill that boy. I got my hand on the gospel plow. You can take things and take things and take things. And you know, we were dealing with a new generation and uh, this new generation had decided that they just had taken as much as they could. It was the system of segregation that had caused in individuals to behave unjustly. And so he said, I'm not trying to put anybody out of business. I'm just trying to put justice in business. 
We're not being accepted in the White House school. We can't go anywhere or do anything or be anybody. At the same time, we're not really accepted anymore in the black high school because we've now made trouble for the black people of the city. They're losing their jobs. My mother lost her job. So we decided that we probably would receive much more uh, effective action by using a so-called cattle prod. And the ones we had had only two small flashlight batteries in them and they produced a mild uh, electric shock and um, left no bruises, no marks, no burns. And I was well familiar with them because I had been in the cattle business. I think they saw in my eye where that I was determined to fight for my freedom, that I wasn't afraid of dying if it really meant that. And I don't know what else they saw in my eye, but whatever it was, you know, I'm thankful to God that they didn't attempt to go through with what they had said that they were going to go through with. Many times, you know, if the spirit is willing, then we don't know what the outcome will be. In keeping with uh, the theme, libraries, uh, I also have the pleasure of introducing another person that I have some familiarity with. Uh, but uh, every time we get together, we talk about her father. <laughs> um, where she knows me from a very small town, about 300 people in that town that I grew up in. And um, the males in that town, they pretty much had uh, a direction of work that was going to uh, take them uh, from whatever age they were to the end of their lives. And that direction of work would have been to be in a coal mine. And that's what um, I and, and many of my uh, peer friends uh, saw as our destiny. And then in that small town was a man um, who turned our, our path and led us into a direction that we could never have imagined. Um, he was a man that went into the service and came back uh, as as sharp as a person could be in uniform, which obviously thrilled us as youth, and started to tell us about a life that uh, we couldn't imagine. Um, and as he shared that information with us, we followed him like uh, the Pied Piper, and we all found ourselves leaving this small town, going uh, the way that he went. Um, and he, he did a great job in helping us to find our way. And so when I think about uh, the person I'm going to introduce, uh, I, I can't help but um, uh, have a little uh, water in my eyes about that, that person and what he did and what he meant to that town. And then to find out that his daughter, uh, and you see her on the program here, uh, found her way uh, in a unique, unique way, which is to um, give us a road map as a people uh, that we can actually look into um, our history and into the depth of our cells uh, on this planet. And um, we could look at how we had made such a marvelous journey as a people uh, in the annals uh, of the work that she's done. And so 
Her name, of course, is on the program, Juliana Richardson, JD, but uh, she is a person who not only uh, is the founder of History Makers, but she is a person who is making it possible now for so many, many young people to find who they are, what they are about, and what they can possibly become. And I'm very privileged to introduce Juliana. Professor Kirkland, you were bringing tears to my eyes just now. Because my father, like Professor Kirkland, was a quiet man. But he packed a lot of power. And you wouldn't, and you should never, never underestimate what he could do. The town they grew up in was a, it was a backwater town where some would say all roads led to nowhere, where men died in the mine. And um, my father dreamed of a, a world outside um, like a lot of black people have. You know, I used to, um, the, the music this morning reminded me of the, the power and the brilliance of our enslaved ancestors and those who came before them and how they've made a way for us to be who we are today. I want to thank uh, Dean McKay for the wonderful reception she had in the People's House. I want to thank Re Reverend Gary Gast and I want to say that I started out in the Baptist Church to, ri to Rabbi Jeffrey Stillman Stiffman, I well understand the Jewish tradition as a proud graduate of Brandeis University. And to our keynote presenter, Cornell Brooks, who I started on the Baptist Church, I was raised in the AME Church, Trinity AME Church in Newark, Ohio. And to the larger <coughs> Washington, oh, I'm sorry, and to Vice Provost Adrian Davis, I look forward to our being able to work together. And to Nafia, what you were talking about in terms of the Henry Hampton Collection and what you've done, bless you. Because coming here to Wash U, where I actually served on the original advisory board for the Henry Hampton Collection, what you've done and what you're doing, God bless you. And to the larger, um, Washington University community, I say thank you for this very special program that you've envisioned, Professor Kirkland, in such a brilliant way. I really, um, I come here today um, because I want you to understand some about my journey in a place here that St. Louis, who, has, who was famous because of the Dred Scott decision, and you have East St. Louis, and then you had Ferguson, which actually may have been hard for you, but captivated the world because we saw the true realities of the black community on television spread around the world. I come here because that actually elevated the discussion and has brought us a new form of activism that is on display today that gives old activists, some of you in the audience here today, a sense of hope that all is not lost, even as we deal in these treacherous times. A little bit about, I want to do two things today because I want to tell a little bit about my story and my project um, as we here celebrate 400 years of Africans in America. 
But I also want to talk about, as we're talking about injustice, I want to talk about the injustice of, of historical ignorance and understanding of the black community. Now, Cornell, he will talk about a lot of injustices, and, and I'm sure he will address in a profound way the issues and, import, and provide important insights on things that we can do correct and deal with the times that we have at hand. Because we have wholesale ignorance of the black experience, and the, until that is corrected, we will exist in a, per, per, a perpetual purgatory of, well, in a world that I don't want to see. So for the sake of time, I want to tell you about my project. So I was, um, I grew up um, in a small town called Newark, Ohio. And um, I was nine years old in this class, the only black kid in my class, because there were, in Newark, we had about 1,000 blacks out of 40,000 whites. And the only thing that we studied about black people were slavery and George Washington Carver. And it was hard for my nine-year-old brain to believe that he could have done all these things with peanuts when all we had been were slaves. <clears throat> then one day, the teacher asked us to talk about our family background. Everyone's hand, it seemed, shot up in the air. You know, they were saying, I'm part German, and I'm part Italian, and I'm part French, and what was I? I, as I sat there, I really didn't have any idea. I think I said Negro or maybe African. I'm not sure I would have even said African. I said Indian because, you know, Native American because most black people think they have Native American in them. And I added in French. I didn't want to be left out. And I felt like the teacher looked at me and knew that I had lied, which I had done that day. And that feeling of not knowing and feeling outside stayed with me until I was in my sophomore year at Brandeis University, researching the Harlem Renaissance. And I remember the day like it was yesterday. It was a fall day. The leaves were golden brown and red. And I'm listening to I'm Just Wild About Harry, written by a black songwriting team of Noble Sissel and Yubi Blake in the 1921 production of Shuffle Along on Broadway. You could have pinched me. Because I, the song that I associated with President Harry Truman, I'm Just Wild About Harry, I found was written by this black songwriting team. And I took my little tape recorder around the streets of Harlem and interviewed people like Butterfly McQueen, who was living in impoverished conditions up in Harlem after earning $5,000 a week when she starred in Gone with the Wind, and people like Honey Coles, tap dancer, and John Henry Clark, a historian, and Lee Whipper, who was the oldest living black actor at the time. Each story informed the other, and joyfully free, is how I felt. And that sense of freedom and self traveled with me to Harvard Law School, my work as a corporate lawyer in government, a production company that I started because I, I started a home shopping channel called Shop Chicago. Um, and then when I was in my mid-40s, single with no children, and I started to ask, what would my legacy be? What would be my leave behind? Although I could not articulate it at the time, I did not want any child to feel the way that, that I did that day when I did not know my own heritage and history. In the novel Invisible Man, Ralph Ellison's protagonist says, when I discover who I am, I will be free. When I discover who I am, I will be free as if the very notion of freedom can be as much mental as physical. 
And the sad thing is I stand here talking to you at least in the city of Chicago, which I call home. The only subject about the black experience that is required to be taught in Chicago public schools is slavery. On college campuses, study is often limited to slavery and civil rights as if those subjects define the black experience. 19 years ago, I set out to change this. 19 years, I sat at my dining room table in front of an empty computer screen, and today we have grown to be the nation's largest African-American video oral history archive. First-person testimony of over 3,200 people recorded in 413 U.S. cities and towns and in places like Mexico, the Caribbean, and Norway. Our oldest history maker, 114-year-old Louisiana Hines, was a World War II Rosie the Riveter. The youngest, Aisha McMillan, a prima ballerina. And as I stand here, there are history makers here in the audience. Will you please stand? Thank you. In 2014, our collection became a permanent part of the nations of the Library of Congress. And as that, the stories of the formerly enslaved were joined by the stories of the descendants of those enslaved. And as we speak, our digital archive now is on campuses um, like Washington University, which I'm really proud to say um, that it's here. And I hope that there will be a lot of things that come of the collaboration, the possibility. But I want to talk about a, just a little bit because you're going to hear a keynote speaker. But, you know, I set out to tell the stories through video or videotape oral history interviews. And about 10 years ago, I started to ask my history makers what they were doing with their papers. Papers are photographs and letters, and even now we can talk about emails. And less than 1% were saving them, less than 1%. And then about three years ago, we start trying to get into the universities. And you know, a lot of them dismissive of us, telling us to go sort of sit over here. And that's when I became concerned. Because if our black leaders are not saving them, and the, you know, the libraries, whether it's in historical societies or university libraries or public libraries, that's where papers are stored. If they're not saving them, then we're losing the 20th century. Now, this is totally unacceptable, totally. We've lost the, the 17th, the 18th, and the 19th, though I really believe that in the archives of, Nor um, of um, Portugal and Great Britain and the Netherlands lie a lot of answers perfectly preserved as archives do. I believe that. But I ask, I, I beg you in this audience today, because if we do not take care to preserve this history that is being thrown out every single day, that Aunt Uncle Ron dies, or Aunt Sally dies, or our parents pass away, then we will be up a creek with no place to go. So I hope that Washington University will be one of the universities working in a leadership role to make to, to make sure that this does not happen. And, and I say that because you've got uh, Mar Margaret Bush Wilson's papers here, and you've got Henry Hampton, but what about Frankie Freeman, and what about all the people that are here in St. Louis that, that have done amazing things in this world? This is critically important because our, our culture is a visual culture. You cannot tell stories unless you can also see them. <clears throat> and I, I say this because we have done our work as black people. 
We have lived our lives. We have built our institutions. And yet it's almost as if we have written our books. We have promoted those books. We have, we have gone around and done speaking tours. And when we get to the end of our life, we take that book and we tear it apart page by page by page. And then we light a fire to it just to make sure that no one will remember what we did while we were on this earth. That's the crisis that we have in front of us. And I just say this, what did I say at the beginning? That the issue that we need to look at is the, social, the injustice of historical ignorance. And, and I ask you this, Remember Ralph Ellison, when I discover who I am, I will be free. When we discover who African Americans are, and the nation and the world will be free of the injustice of ignorance. Thank you. Okay, we're now ready to have the next on the program, Dancing and Drumming. Habaragani, que pasa? Hola, I know Shamika. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We are honored to be here. We are a Better Family Life, Kaumba Youth Performance Ensemble, also known as Kipe. We would like to do our rendition this evening of a jitterbug piece. Dancers, come to your places, please. You see our dap little guys up in the front. Please understand that they will be coming down the aisle. So if you have to get up, if you could refrain until after they have passed through. And in the front, we have Miss Samantha Madison, our technical and give me a signal when we're ready to start that music. We are very pleased to let you know that these youth practice at our headquarters at 5415 Page Boulevard in St. Louis, Missouri, along with all of our many other components. They travel and have performed at the International Salsa Congress, the African Arts Festival. We have been honored to be here at the first segment of the 400 plus. We have also performed for the Festival of Nations, Kwanzaa's Art Museum, Chicago Public Libraries, and the list goes on and on. Their ages are between 10 and, well, actually now we have a 30-year-old. <laughs> that can't be too old. How are we doing, Ms. Madison? Thank you so much, and the jitterbug. Have fun, ladies and gentlemen.
Si say sa so what? Give them a hand, let me tell you. Come back on stage very quickly, on stage. On stage, on stage, stay on stage. There you are, let's have our guys come up and take your bow. Come up, take your bow. Corin, up. Boys, let the boys come up. And bow, where's your bow? Show us what you got. <laughs> and Demetrius, Sanford, and Corin. And off, our ladies on stage. And come forward, what you got? And Lutetia and Adriana. And come on. Yes, yes. Mariah, thank you. Come on. Yes. <laughs> Man, this is something we need to make sure we keep our history up. Who does this? Yes. There you are, our guys. Terrell, Dominique, Caleb, Caleb, Everett, girls. Yes, and Taylor, Kamaria, Jayla, Amor, Stacy, and our baby, come up. Our little, what are we gonna do? <laughs> what you do? Come on, just do something. Come on, do a little something, something. And that is Alayla and Kayla, something, Kalea. Okay, good. Do not. We want to thank all the people that come out, support Better Family Life. 
This is our after school program performance component. We are there Monday through Friday, our summer camp starts. We are looking to make sure that our history is retained. We're not just about the hip hop, we're about the jazz, the tap, the, all the dance styles, the Catherine Dunham, Palazzo Ren, all of those people that made St. Louis what it is. A grand bow, arms up, Jayla. Let's bow, y'all. And thank you, Samantha Madison. And our other instructor, come out, please. Come out, Samantha Madison is one of our rehearsal coaches. And I am Vivian Anderson Water, artistic director and choreographer. Thank you so much. Let's go, guys. Oh, yes. Nice. And thank you, Miranda Jones, our vice president over at Sitting Up. We appreciate everything, Miss Cynthia, for having us come today. Thank you. And not to last but not least, and I was remiss if I don't see Baba Ed. If you were here earlier, you saw our drum warriors. Please give them a hand. We teach djembe also. We have musical and vocal music also. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Um, Nadia, um, <laughs> I want you to introduce the next speaker, and then she, in turn, will introduce the keynote speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Mary Curtis Horowitz. As I previously mentioned, Mrs. Horowitz is the impetus behind the University Library's Mary Curtis Horowitz Lecture Series for Civil Engagement and Social Policy. Her generosity has made it possible for the university to bring Mr. Cornell Brooks to campus today. Mrs. Horowitz is a 1968 graduate of the College of Arts and Sciences, where she graduated in history. Her late husband, Irving, was a former member of the Washington University faculty and a founder of Transaction Publishers a major publishing house specializing in social science books. Mrs. Horowitz worked for 45 years in academic publishing and until 2017 was president and board chair of Transaction Publishing. She now serves as chair and trustee of the Horowitz Foundation for Social Policy. The foundation supports the advancement of social science research with a focus on policy. Its specific mis mission is to award grants to aspiring PhD candidates that support their dissertation research. Since its inception in 1997, the foundation has awarded grants to 250 researchers at more than 100 universities around the world. At the university, yes. It's worthy. <laughs> At the university, Mrs. Horowitz serves on the Brown School National Council. So please join me in welcoming Mary Curtis Horowitz. Thank you, Nadia, for those very kind remarks. I'm here to introduce, and it's my great pleasure to introduce, Cornell William Brooks. Cornell William Brooks is currently professor of the practice of public leadership and social justice at the Harvard Kennedy School. From 2014 to 2017, Mr. Brooks served as president and CEO of the NAACP. He is a civil rights attorney and a fourth generation ordained minister of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. During his tenure at the NAACP, Cornell Brooks reinvigorated the activist social justice heritage of that organization, dramatically increasing its membership and in two years achieving 12 significant legal victories. He conceived and led the America's Journey for Justice March from Selma, Alabama to Washington, D.C. over 40 days and 1,000 miles. Closer to home, 
Mr. Brooks also led a 134-mile seven-day march from the home of Michael Brown in Ferguson to the home of Governor J. Nixon in Jefferson City in protest against police brutality and in support of a municipal fine law as well as the Justice Department investigation and settlement. Prior to leading the NAACP, Cornell Brooks was president and CEO of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, where he led the passage of pioneering criminal justice reform and housing legislation. Six new bills in less than five years. In Washington, he held leadership roles in federal and local government. He was a trial attorney at both the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law and the U.S. Department of Justice. Mr. Brooks holds a JD from Yale Law School, a Master of Divinity from Boston University School of Theology, and a BA from Jackson State University in Mississippi. He has received honorary doctorates from multiple institutions of higher education. Cornell William Brooks' life is one of constructive activism. He inspires others. He builds coalitions. He gets things done. He is the perfect choice for this inaugural lecture in the series I'm sponsoring, which is also the second in the trilogy recognizing African American history in this country. Please go, join me in welcoming Cornell William Brooks back to St. Louis. Good afternoon. Now, after we've enjoyed this beautiful tapestry of music and dance, uh, that good afternoon would suffice someplace else. But since our spirits have been moved, our hearts have been touched, I want to say good afternoon. I want you to say it loud enough and spirit-filled enough for our forebears, our foremothers, our forefathers to hear us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> I know I'm in the right place. <laughs> I want to ex extend a word of appreciation to the sponsor of this event. We do not take for granted this occasion to remember our foremothers, our forefathers, our forebears in this beautiful chapel. I also want to thank Professor Kirkland and his wife, who, as I understood, understand, gave him the idea to invite me. Okay. Now, uh, Ms. Horowitz was kind enough to support this event, uh, but I also want to take note of someone who's been married for more than a minute. I've been given credit for a great many ideas I had nothing to do with that uh, my wife brought to my attention. So I'm very, very thankful for, for this uh, kind invitation. I also want to thank my uh, classmate, uh, Adrian Davis, who, uh, truth be told, was a change maker and somewhat of a firebrand uh, at Yale Law School many years ago. Now, I know she's kept that deep under wraps and on the down low, but she's been a change maker for uh, a long, long way back. I also want to thank uh, the conveners of this extraordinary uh, lecture series. I also want to thank the choirs, the artists, uh, the children, all of those who literally set this place on fire. I also want to thank the administration uh, those who preceded me here at the podium, and certainly the clergy uh, for being, or being, in this pres being in this place today, certainly the rabbi and the pastor. Now to all of you who have come to this wonderful place, I want to thank you for taking time 
to remember uh, our forebears uh, this afternoon. Now, I want to just uh, share with you, since we are in this beautiful chapel, that uh, I've not always been so fortunate to be in the midst of such an august body. And so if you don't mind, I'll, I'll share with you a true story about why I feel so fortunate to be in the midst of such a distinguished group of people uh, at such a wonderful university. So many years ago, I found myself on a Sunday morning in London, England, in a beautiful Gothic cathedral, not unlike Graham Chapel. I found myself as a young man, as a young seminarian, on a Sunday morning outside of this beautiful Gothic cathedral, standing on the sidewalk looking in, looking upward at these spires soaring toward the heavens, these stained glass windows reflecting the iridescent, multicolored, multi-hued beauty of God. And as a young, innocent, naive, presumptuous preacher standing on that sidewalk outside of that Gothic cathedral, I supposed and assumed that there were 2,000 or so people inside waiting to hear this young, naive, presumptuous preacher preach. Now, Professor, I, I made my way into the sanctuary, true story, and I immediately noticed the obvious, the pastor and exactly two members. One member I'll call Ms. Smith, one member I'll call Ms. Jones. Now, I did as I was taught to do as a young seminarian, which is to say that you speak, you share, you preach to two people in the same way that you would to 2,000, with sincerity, with conviction, with a sense of preparation, with a sense of one's calling. Now, I made my way to the podium, and or rather to the pulpit, this rather uh, elaborate affair that you had to enter a spiral uh, staircase and ascend upward. So standing at the top of this staircase, in the midst of this pulpit, I began to preach. And as I began to preach, I immediately noticed the obvious, that Miss Jones immediately fell asleep. True story. <laughs> Now, this only inspired me to preach with greater conviction and fervor. And as I was speaking, as I was preaching, I immediately noticed the obvious, that Miss Smith seemed to hang on to every word I had to say. She nodded her head. She tapped her toes. She clapped her hands at all the right theological and liturgical moments. And I thought to myself, at least I'm reaching one somebody this Sunday morning. Well, I concluded my little homily, made my way to the side of the pastor, and the pastor said to me, Brother Brooks, I'm just so sorry. Miss Jones, she falls asleep. She falls asleep on everybody, and Miss Smith is out of her mind and did not understand a thing you had to say. <laughs> Absolutely true story. So you can see, well, I'm so delighted to be here at Graham Chapel on the campus of Washington University in St. Louis. This afternoon, in this majestic stone cathedral of the campus of Washington University, I want to prayerfully lift up a few words about two less ornate structures not cathedrals, but rather the auction blocks of slavery. Two auction blocks, two tables upon which human beings were sold. One auction block in upstate New York, the other auction block in Charleston, South Carolina. I'll ask that you recall two auction blocks to structures on which human beings, God's children, our forebears, our foremothers, our forefathers were sold. Rhiannon Giddens, a classically trained vocalist, an African-American old-time music curator, a phenom banjo player with a heartbreakingly beautiful voice, Giddens, lyrically describes 
the sale of a young African on an auction block in upstate New York. She describes a young woman standing on an auction block about to be sold in the 1860s, or rather 1830s. She describes this woman being sold, and she also describes the advertisement for the sale. The advertisement read, Negro wench for sale, and a list of her attributes. But at the bottom of this advertisement for the sale of a human being, was this seemingly innocuous phrase, child for sale, quote, at the purchaser's option. A little bitty baby for sale at the purchaser's option. A condition on a transaction in which a child is lifted up as an afterthought, a capitalized afterthought at the purchaser's option. As a fourth generation minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, I have to morally wonder, I have to morally imagine how this young woman felt to have her child for sale to have her soul and her body and her mind ostensibly for sale at the purchaser's option. I have to wonder, how did this woman feel? How did she, she wrestle with the constraint on her moral agency, the chains and shackles on humanity? How did she feel? How did she imagine herself? How did she imagine a future for her child at the purchaser's option. And so we gather here in this sanctuary, this Gothic cathedral, this stone chapel on this august campus, and we have to wonder within ourselves in 2019, 400 years since the inauguration of slavery in the United States, how did she feel? But I also have to wonder, how did she maintain a sense of hope? And this is no abstract moral query. This is no, no irrelevant ethical interrogative in 2019. We as African American people, we as people of every hue and heritage, we as Americans have to ask ourselves, how do we maintain hope? Is hope for sale at the purchaser's option? And so here, we gather in this place. And so I want to just lift up as a subject for your consideration, hope on the auction block. Hope on the auction block. And I'd like to just reflect on two present day civil rights challenges in the context of 400 years of slavery, those challenges being criminal justice reform and voting rights. But before we can talk about present day challenges, some may question the moral propriety, the relevance of gathering together in a chapel to mark the occasion of 400 years of slavery. This is not an abstract question for me because in my enthusiasm over the prospect of coming to St. Louis again, I posted on Twitter with great joy that I'd be speaking in this chapel on this campus. And in response to my modest little tweet, someone posed the question via Twitter, 400 years of slavery? 
Why are you talking about 400 years of slavery? That was 400 years ago. There are people yet asking the question, why do we mark this occasion? Why do we talk about slavery? Why do we talk about what we came through, what we've been through? what we have yet to go through. Why do we talk about how our forebears were brought to this country in the bowels of ships? Why do we insist upon dredging up these painful, awful, agonizing memories? Why do we insist on talking about our enslaved ancestors? Why do we insist upon talking about slavery in St. Louis, Missouri? May I suggest to you that this question is entirely relevant because the history is as old as your Twitter feed, as old as your post on Facebook, as relevant as the pictures you post on Instagram. Slavery is not yesterday. It is, in fact, today. The arc of slavery does not merely extend from a slave ship that arrived in Jamestown in August of 1619 called the White Lion. It does not merely extend from that slave ship to the slave ship that arrived in the Bay of Mobile in 1860. It's longer and larger than that. The arc of slavery in all of its moral ugliness and tragedy extends well beyond a black woman named Angela who arrived four days after the first ship that we know of at Jamestown to the African-American woman who survived well into this century who descended from a slave ship called Clotilda in Mobile Bay, Alabama. Two black women, two pictures of resistance, two pictures of resilience. The arc of slavery extends well beyond them. Some are asking the question, why, 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 why do we talk about slavery? Why do we insist upon invoking its ugly memory in the midst of our respectable politics and our liturgy of respectability? Why do we insist upon talking about slavery in the midst of our white shoe and silk stocking churches? Why do we insist upon talking about slavery in the midst of our synagogues and our mosques? Why do we talk about slavery in the midst of so many bourgeois? post-racial Negroes. <laughs> Slavery is not yet ended. You see, because when I arrived in Ferguson a few years ago and came face to face with the faces of mass incarceration that looked a lot like the faces of mass incarceration I met in Newark, New Jersey, that I met in Georgetown, South Carolina, where I'm from, that I've met in New York, in Chicago, in L.A. I know slavery has not ended. Sure, slavery formally ended 246 years ago in 1865. The convict leasing system only ended formally in 1941, and mass incarceration yet continues in 2019. So we talk about slavery, we study slavery, we analyze the travails of our people because we seek to understand ourselves and seek to understand the moral condition of this country in this present Twitter moment. Slavery is that which cannot be ignored, that which cannot be silenced, that which cannot be rendered mute. Why? Because our forebears literally speak to us. 
They speak to us in the hymns. They speak to us in the liturgy of the black church. They speak to us in terms of our protests. They speak to us in terms of our sermons. They speak to us in terms of our faith. They speak to us in terms of our doubt. They speak to us now in this present moment. When you walk the streets of St. Louis, you hear our forebears speaking. The first president of this university risked his life to free a black man from his captors. Slavery has marked this campus. Slavery has marked this state. Slavery has marked this nation. Slavery is the original sin of the republic. You can no more forget about slavery than you can forget about original sin in Genesis. You cannot raise and cannot read the Constitution without reading, literally, the history of our people. The Constitution is not rendered in script on a piece of faded parchment buried in the bowels of the National Archives but rather it is written in the blood, sweat, and tears of our people. Slavery speaks to this present moment. Consider where we are in terms of criminal justice. At the present moment, 2.2 million Americans behind bars, one million fathers behind bars, African-American women being a fast and tragically growing demographic within the American penal system. All across this country, we have buried children in the basement of the criminal justice system. This is not past, it is in fact present. Why? Because America's criminal justice system came into being, yes, at the beginning of the Republic, but it was fueled and inspired by American slavery. We know, because we're here in church, that the first black man who was subjected to solitary confinement as defined by Quaker theology in Eastern State Penitentiary, the first person subjected to solitary confinement was a black man. We know that the 13th Amendment has a, an escape clause, an exception, if you will, large enough to hold our children's hopes, our children's aspirations, our children's bodies. And those of us who work for criminal justice reform from one end of the country to the other understand all too well that we are engaged in an abolitionist project. We are doing our work in the spirit of Frederick Douglass and in the spirit of Harriet Tubman. We are trying to free our people from captivity. <laughs> Slavery is not yesterday, it is today. And so when you see someone who has been described by no less a person than the President of the United States as a thug, you can, trans, you can morally translate and transliterate the term thug into enslaved person. We have no thugs, we have no convicts, we have no felons categorically and morally as such. We have literally human beings who are enslaved. And so we gather here today to mark this occasion, to commemorate 400 years of slavery in the United States, to refuel and inspire and rededicate ourselves to eliminating the slavery of mass incarceration today. When we read about the black codes, and the slave patrols, and the convict leasing system. And when we think about prisons being built to house human beings, for profit, turning our bodies into commodities, we study the past in order to be inspired in the present. And so when we think about 
literally our children running from the police. We think about Michael Brown's body on the pavement for hours on end. We are reminded that this, this scheme and system of suspicion of rendering us born suspect did not begin with the war on drugs, did not begin with the Southern strategy, did not begin with Nixon, did not begin with Reagan, did not begin with Clinton, did not begin with the crime bill, it began with slavery. And so make no mistake, we come to this place honoring our forebears by dedicating ourselves to bringing about criminal justice reform in 2019. That means abolishing the prison system as we know it. Some will dismiss this is morally fanciful. But may I remind you, in the 1970s, prison abolition was considered a viable theory, a viable policy objective. May I remind you that in the last 10 years, we have cut the juvenile incarceration rate in this country by over half. So in other words, if we can get rid of kiddie prisons, we can get rid of adult prisons. If we can find a way to lock up fewer of our children, we can find a way to lock up fewer of our mamas and daddies. We can abolish the criminal, or I should say the carceral state in this country. It is possible. It is within our moral grasp. It need not be that we lock up our own. It need not be that we incarcerate our own. It need not be, as we saw in Ferguson, an unholy trinity between the courthouse, city hall, and the police department. It need not be that we have this ugly and immoral relationship between predatory taxation and predatory policing. In the same way that we saw young people put Michael Brown's name on President Obama's lips in Geneva, Switzerland, in the same way the young people stood up and declared to this country that black lives matter. Why? Because black lives matter is the ethical predicate to all lives matter. Unless the first is true, the second can never be true. We commemorate slavery because we, more than 50 years since the passage of the Voting Rights Act, find ourselves with a rather tenuous grip on the franchise. Here we are in the wake of the 15th Amendment, in the wake of the Voting Rights Act, in the wake of Selma yet fighting to hold on to the right to vote. We've seen in the wake of Shelby versus Holder, nothing less than the Machiavellian frenzy of voter disenfranchisement. We have seen over and over and over again our right to vote being taken away from us. We understand. We understand that police misconduct is not merely a matter of police brutality, it's also a matter of voter suppression and voter disempowerment. <laughs> this voting rights struggle is very much rooted in the struggle of our ancestors. Now, lest you think that this is an academic matter for me, let me note parenthetically and biographically. Back in the 1940s, my grandfather was inspired by an NAACP lawyer by the name of Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall won a case called Smith versus Allwright, which outlawed the all-white Southern Democratic primary, which basically had this effect. If you couldn't participate in the all-white Southern Democratic primary, where every office holder in the Deep South was a Democrat, you could not participate in the democratic process. When that case was won in the Supreme Court, my granddaddy, an AME preacher, 
Notwithstanding the Klan, notwithstanding white nationalists, notwithstanding white supremacists, he ran for Congress in the low country of South Carolina. He did not run because he thought he could win. He did not run because Fox News told him he could win. He did not run because a Gallup poll told him he could win. He ran because he wanted to empower African Americans to vote. And let me just share this with you. My granddaddy did poorly. He didn't win, got less than 2% of the vote. But my granddaddy inspired his daughter, Jamie Prelo, my mother, and my mother's classmate, who also ran for Congress in the 6th District of South Carolina. My mama's classmate is named the representative or congressman James Clyburn. So don't tell me what we can't do being inspired by our forebears. So here we are in the present moment. The right to vote hangs in the balance. But what we know is this. During the period of Reconstruction, African Americans elected members of Congress members of the Senate. There were black governors, black lieutenant governor, black office holders. Black people went from zero at the ballot box to literally thousands across the country voting and being represented in public office. And so we say to ourselves in 2019, what can we do? What can we do when we trust ourselves, when we believe in ourselves, when we support one another, when we believe in our own moral agency and our political efficacy? What happens when we follow black women to the ballot box? What happens when we start believing that our young people are not meant to merely listen to us and to emulate us, but emulate us by leading us? What happens? When inspired by our forebears, we register to vote, we run for office, we support our campaigns. When you read the slave narratives and read about what they went through, read people who speak in a patois, a creole, a Gullah language like where I come from, Sometimes ineloquently, some would say illiterately, but with an eloquence. What happens when you read those slave narratives and they speak to you? They speak to you in the same way that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John speak to us. They speak to you in the same way the Pauline epistles speak to you. They speak to you in the same way that the Hebrew scriptures speak to us, in the same way. That the story of Abraham and Jacob and Moses speak to us and Caleb speak to us. They speak to us in terms of liberation, in terms of freedom, in terms of our aspirations. They speak to us in terms of our moral possibilities. Criminal justice reform and voting rights. But may I suggest to you that when you turn the gilded pages of an ugly history, there's certain leadership lessons that speak to us in the present moment. The first of which is patriotism is a form of resistance. I want somebody who loves the American flag, somebody who stands for the national anthem to hear what I just said. Patriotism can be a form of resistance. I want you to imagine in 1863, in the morning, northern ministers at Port Royal, Union soldiers who were black wearing blue uniforms. I want you to imagine African American women gathered by the thousands, or by a thousand, at least a thousand, at Port Royal, South Carolina, listening to the words of Lincoln read to them listening to a draft of the emancipation read to them. As they listen to the words coming from a presidential pen, 
Historians tell us that these former slaves, these African-American men and women and soldiers and nurses and at least one teacher hearing the words of the Emancipation Proclamation read to them spontaneously and tearfully broke out into my country, tears of thee, sweet land of liberty. In other words, their resistance was a form of patriotism. So I want to say for those who would dismiss a generation of activists in Ferguson as disruptive protesters, those who don't possess the sensibilities to respect our politics of respectability. May I suggest to you that these who were dismissed as unruly and ungrateful protesters were also practitioners of democracy, standing in the lineage of Frederick Douglass, standing in the lineage of Harriet Tubman, standing in the lineage of the Grimke sisters, standing in the lineage of Rosa Parks, standing in the lineage of Martin Luther King. Why? Because you do not protest against something unless you stand for something. You're not able to declare that you hate injustice unless you first love justice. And when you to assert black lives matter must mean that you love black people, that you have an affection for black people, that you appreciate the beauty and brilliance of black people, that you understand that black humanity is a measure and marker of divinity in this world. Why? Because we're taught in the Hebrew scriptures about the Imago Dei. Martin Luther King preached on this, the Imago Dei, the notion that we are created in the image of God and as such have innate worth and value. So when protesters say black lives matter, don't get upset, don't get bothered, don't get exercised, it's in the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence is predicated on the notion that we are endowed with certain inalienable rights based upon our being created in the image of God, the imago Dei, self-worth, innate worth. In other words, black lives matter. Now, I'm not entirely sure Thomas Jefferson meant that. I'm not entirely sure the founding fathers were tweeting that. I'm not entirely sure what they were doing back then. But philosophically speaking, it is correct. Dr. Luke, Martin Luther King preached on this. So the first leadership lesson here is that patriotism is a form of protest. And protest is a form of patriotism. Second leadership lesson I want to lift up is that if you take note of the history, within a few years of emancipation, African Americans started newspapers, they started literary societies, they started schools, they began to teach one another, the literacy rate literally exploded. So I want to suggest to you that there's relationship between scholarship and activism. I want to suggest to you on this college campus that there's relationship between serious scholarship and sacred values. You see, because when we began to agitate, when we began to protest, when we began to demonstrate, it is predicated on an understanding, a profound understanding of not only our humanity, but also our aspirations, and also our civil rights, and also our human rights. And so, in the same way that the vice provost has lifted up that scholarship is not merely relegated to the academy, but it is also the province of the streets. So we've got to come to the side of those in the streets with our research papers, with our black papers, with our theses, with our dissertations, with our analytic capital. Why? Because we need to study what they are protesting and demonstrating for that we might make the empirical as well as the moral case for a better country. Last point here is hope. Hope on the auction block. A story is told about a newspaper reporter from 
a paper in Boston who went down to Charleston, South Carolina in, all right, shortly after the end of the Civil War. He wanted to talk with human beings who had been sold. And so he went to Charleston and he looked high and low for the largest auction block, the largest slave market. And he stood before an auction block. And as he stood there, a woman by the name of Donna Moore standing behind him said, I was sold on that table two years ago. He interviewed her and talked with her. And she said, Jesus, I thank God for my freedom. But my husband has been sold away and I do not know where they sold him. Hope on the auction block. This formerly enslaved woman invoked her God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Jews and the God of the Christians, the God of the Muslims. She invoked her God in remembering the tragedy of slavery. But she also invoked her husband, her family, Hope on the auction block meant that when the slaves were set free, the first thing they did was try to restore their families. You recall that Harriet Tubman, who freed scores of slaves, the Moses of our people, returned to the Egypt land of slavery again and again and again to set her family free. So in 2019, we knowing that there's hope on the auction block, have to restore and unite our families. We've got to reclaim those who have been captured by the criminal justice system. We've got to reclaim those who are instead by poverty. We've got to reclaim those who are too cynical, too jaded, too pessimistic to vote. We've got to claim our own. James Cone, the theologian, the architect of black theology talks about hope being resident in our hymns, in our music, in our liturgy. I'll dare say as a preacher who's been inside of a nightclub, there's hope in the jitterbug. You understand that when, when African Americans dance on Saturday night, they move from side to side. On Sunday morning, they move up and down. But the movement is by the Spirit. The movement is of God. The movement is a part of our faith. The movement is an expression of our hope. And so, in the same way that Harriet reclaimed her own, we've got to reclaim our own. May I suggest to you, in the wake of the Attorney General's settlement and report and the Ferguson Commission and all that happened, there's still, there's still a reclamation project, project to be done. We've got to reclaim those others have declared loss. We've got to reclaim those who have been sold at the purchaser's option. We've got to reclaim the poor. We've got to reclaim the lost. We've got to re reclaim those others have given up on. We've got to reclaim our people. We've got to call to our people. Why? Because we love one another. Harriet Tubman journeyed back into slavery because she loved her family and loved her people. When we look across this beautiful sanctuary, can't we declare we love one another? Can't we declare that we have value? Can't we declare that we have worth? Can't we declare that we are worthy of freedom? We are worthy of liberation. And so, when I think about that auction block in my home city of Charleston, I know there's hope on the auction block. But I also think about a group of school children who on the occasion of the birth of Abraham Lincoln, one of our most famous 
poets penned a few words in celebration of Lincoln's birthday that came to be the anthem of the NAACP and the anthem of a people. And those words, too, speak of hope. The words being these, lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on. 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 Till victory is won. Speaking of marching, ah, oh, wonderful. Let me just uh, give appreciation for the committee that put this program on. Let's uh, give them some real hands of applause. And you, you see some people walking around with uh, T-shirts on that has this, that's, those are some uh, volunteers who, who are just really celebrating um, in dress what you've been exposed to in prose. And as we end the refrain, let us do it the way that it's done in almost all of the civil rights movement uh, uh, endings, and that is, we shall overcome. Let's stand and sing it. <clears throat> Somebody will have to lead it, because uh, that's not my particular <laughs> Here we go. The Lord will see us through. The Lord will see us through someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe the Lord will see us through. Someday, the third stanza, we're on to victory. We're on to victory. We're on to victory. We're on to victory. walk hand in hand we'll walk hand in hand we'll walk hand in hand we'll walk hand in hand someday oh deep in my heart I Someday we 
are not afraid. Come on, everyone. We are not afraid. We are not afraid. We are not afraid to shall make us free. Come on, everyone. The truth shall make us free. The truth shall make us free. The truth shall make us free. So Come on, the last verse. We shall live in peace. Come on, everyone. We shall live in peace. 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 Yeah, very good. That ends our program, and uh, you can stay and mingle and talk with friends, but we are finished. We're finished with the program, but we're going ahead with the battle. <laughs>